Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Although we now suffer grief in all kinds of trials, we greatly rejoice. Through faith, we are shielded by God's power until the coming day of salvation. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you went to Jerusalem. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross. And Lord, we thank you that you did exactly as you said that you would. You did rise on the third day. So Lord, we gather this day to celebrate you. We ask that your spirit would be among us. We hope, Lord, that we can experience you in a new way. Thank you, Lord, for who you are, the Alpha and the Omega, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lord Jesus, as we gather this day, we come here confessing that we do not seek you first. We do not seek you with our whole heart. So Lord, we pray silently, confessing our need of you, our Savior. Hear us, Lord, as we pray silently our sins. Thank you, Lord, for your tender mercy, for calling us to share with you our sins and knowing the truth of your good news, that as far as the east is from the west, so far you remove our transgressions from us. We thank you, Lord, that you are our salvation. You are our savior. And so, Lord, this day as we gather, we pray the prayer today that you taught your disciples long ago, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We have peace with God. Thanks be to God. Let us extend God's peace to one another at this time. Well, we sure do want to extend a warm welcome to you to Triangle Grace Church. I know there's family in town and uh, perhaps some visitors among us. We're just grateful that you have chosen to worship with us, gather with us, and recognize the goodness of God through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you don't have a church home and you're in the area, we just want to welcome you, invite you to consider Triangle Grace as a potential place to call your church family. You'll see there's lots of different things to do in the life of our church. You can flip through the bulletin, go on our website, uh, and find out all kinds of uh, interesting opportunities to grow in friendship and fellowship and grow in faith uh, together uh, as a church family. There is in front of you, uh, I'm new card, and if you're interested in having me or one of uh, our staff reach out to you and this coming week and just say hi and answer any questions you have about the life of our church, you can fill that card out, drop it in, in the offering plate uh, later in the service. And um, I, I did want to just pull out this uh, sheet that's in your bulletin uh, and encourage you to put this on your refrigerator at home uh, and or give it to a friend, uh, a neighbor. Uh, if, if you're involved in the church, you know this is happening already, take this and, and offer it to someone who's uh, a part of your life uh, that you love uh, and invite them either or both to 
an amazing concert that will unfold uh, it, on April 13th. Uh, fantastic musicians of those within the church and a guest musician outside the church, Hanukkah Castle. Uh, it will be a night that if you come, you're going to be glad that you came and you're going to be glad that your friends uh, came with you as well. So invite some friends to that. And if you are interested in issues of faith and just want to explore who Jesus is uh, and what it means to have a relationship with him, ask the questions that you uh, sometimes are afraid to ask or don't know who to ask, this opportunity called Alpha will give you that opportunity uh, in the coming weeks. So we'd hope you'd encourage uh, friends to be a part of that as well. Having said that, let's continue to worship our Lord, uh, remembering his resurrection this day. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> in lieu of a children's sermon, we invite the children to stay with us. But those who would like to follow Miss Nancy to Children's Church can do so at this time. And while they prepare to do that, we will sing Spirit of the Living God. Let's pray. Lord, we would ask that your spirit would fall upon us in just that way, to mold us, to shape us, to give us life as we consider this great event in history that we celebrate this day, the resurrection of your son, the one we confess as our Lord and Savior. We ask this in your name. Amen. If you've been with us over the past Six weeks, we have been looking at the four accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we've reflected on the person people met when they met the person Jesus. What was he like? Oh, his character, his nature, and we've reflected on his humility and his compassion, uh, his wisdom and his goodness, his spirituality, his determination to see things through. All of these were richly manifest when you met this person. And just touching on these six attributes of Jesus, you, you, you got, you, you're just totally taken by him, captivated by the, the person that he was. There's a book written by Charles Edward Jefferson, a 1908 classic called The Character of Jesus. And uh, it, it, you can find it, a PDF of it online if you're interested. But we've only explored six characteristics. Uh, Jefferson goes on with a number of others, his originality, his strength, his sincerity, his uh, optimism, his candor, his honesty, his generosity, his patience, his enthusiasm, and a host of other qualities that just are as evident as can be if you 
read the accounts of his life in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. The, the character of this man uh, from Galilee was simply arresting, so much so that the 19th century Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, he wrote this. He, he says that even those who have renounced Christianity and attack it, in their inmost being, still follow the Christian ideal. For hitherto, neither their subtlety nor their ardor of their hearts has been able to create a higher ideal of man and of the virtue of mankind than the ideal given to us by the example and person of Jesus Christ. In high school or college, you may have uh, studied the writings of, of John Stuart Mill. He was a 19th century uh, uh, ph philosopher, uh, a contemporary of Dostoevsky's. Uh, he was also a skeptic and an antagonist of Christianity. And if to prove Dostoevsky's very point, this is what he writes about Jesus. He says, about the life and sayings of Jesus, there is a stamp of personal originality combined with profundity of insight in the very first rank of men of sublime genius of whom our species can boast. When this preeminent genius is combined with the qualities of probability, the greatest more uh, qualities of probably the greatest moral reformer and martyr to that mission, whoever existed upon earth, religion cannot be said to have made a bad choice in pitching on this man as the ideal representative and guide of humanity. Nor even now would it be easy, even for the unbeliever of which I am, John Stuart Mill says, to find a better translation of the rule of virtue from the abstract into the concrete than to endeavor so to live that Christ would approve our life from the lips of a philosopher who did not believe in Jesus Christ. Or if you want to bring it to more recent times, the 1970s band, the Doob, well, for me, 1970s feel, feels more recent. For some of you, is, you know, but, but the, the Doobie Brothers band, uh, that band, the Doobie Brothers, um, they wrote a, 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 a hit that captured this, this idea that you may remember called Jesus is just all right with me, brother. You know, Jesus is just all right. There's something about this man, Jesus, that, that speaks to those who were atheists, those who were believers, that cross religion, that crosses culture that crosses political divides, uh, those who first trusted in him and admired him were Jews. M many Jews today still admire Jesus. Jesus is thought to be among Muslims, an, an honored prophet. Gandhi praised Jesus Hindus, are, they're not reluctant to identify Jesus as a holy man. Democrats, Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, Republicans, Ronald Reagan and both of the George Bushes, they all were comfortable calling Jesus their Lord, admiring and following this man. It, it was no different in Jesus' day. Nicodemus and, and Paul, they were to people who were of the religious elite, the, the Pharisees, they, they were the ones in power. And guess what? They ended up choosing to follow this man, Jesus. 
A Roman soldier was heard saying, this is the son of God, a Roman soldier. A Samaritan woman could not wait to go and tell everybody about this man once they met him. An Ethiopian government official became one of the first followers of Jesus from the continent of Africa, according to Luke's writings. Those with disabilities turned to him. Prostitutes turned to him. Those troubled by spiritual matters, revolutionary zealots, tax collectors, fishermen, you name it, from the highest to the lowest, they were all open. He crossed religious divides. He crossed political divides. He crossed racial divides. Then and now, he appeals to the best impulses of those on the left and those on the right. He's seen as the champion of the poor by social activists. He's revolutionaries love him. Those in power who wish to rule uh, rightly, they heed his counsel. Philosophers are captivated by his take on the world. Moms and dads wish their daughters would find a man like Jesus to marry, <laughs> even though they might be a little concerned about his proclivity to wander from town to town. <laughs> if you combine all the riches Richest men and women who ever lived, all the most powerful people in the entire world, all the armies. Jesus Christ has made the greatest impact. Combine them all together. He's made a greater impact than any of them. There's a reason that the Bible is the greatest selling book of all history. More copies have been bought and shared. Why? It's because of Jesus Christ. You cannot deny the impact that this man had and has. And from this perspective, just from this perspective, wherever you are in your life, it just seems like you should study this man and, and come to think, why in the world are so many people taken captive by the arresting example and character and the, the way that this man lived his life? You, you should come to terms with who he is. But if you do... If you open up the Bible and you read four different accounts of his life, you'll realize soon that it's not his compassion, it's not his humility that will cause the greatest stir around the lake in Galilee or in the city of Jerusalem. It was that Jesus exhibited a genuine power unlike anyone else had ever done. Unlike anyone had ever experienced before. He was a man of compassion. He was a man of humility and wisdom and spirituality and determination and all the other characteristics. But what left their mouths draped open was an extraordinary display of power. According, again, four different accounts repeatedly witnessed to acts that thousands and thousands of other people saw and could not deny and could not explain whether they were the closest people with him or the religious leaders, those who opposed him. But they all saw it and, and couldn't deny what they saw. They experienced this power just by the words that he spoke. When Jesus spoke in a synagogue in Capernaum, 
uh, Luke records that those who heard him were amazed at his teaching because the words had power. He, he didn't speak like the other teachers. There was a force that when he spoke caused hearts to flutter, minds to be captivated. There was a, a different sense of life and power that was experienced when he spoke. When the disciples, they were in a boat in the midst of a life-threatening storm. And Jesus stands up and he says, be still, peace, and the storm stops. And I know that is crazy. You, we would all... Well, it's hard for us to go, oh yeah, that really happened. And guess what? That is exactly how the disciples reacted as well. Completely making sense. They looked at one another in utter disbelief at the power of his word. And they said to each other, who in the world is this man? Just like you and I would have asked. It wasn't... It was, it was this combination of word and deed that, that manifested his power. He made people walk who had never walked before. And there were lots of people around who knew that man, those men who didn't walk and then saw him walk. People who were seriously ill on their deathbeds, diseased skin, a woman who could not Stop bleeding. He made them all well. And there were lots of people around who saw him do this. John uh, 9, there's religious leaders go to some parents whose son was blind from the day he was born. And Jesus heals him, and these leaders go to them and say, tell us how this happened. And guess what they said? We have no idea. Go talk to him. They go and ask the son. And he says, look, I don't know, but all I can tell you is that I was blind but now I see. The mom and dad saw it. They knew who their son was. John 11, a man was dead uh, in the grave. And, and Jesus goes to the tomb uh, of Lazarus, speaks a word. He comes out of that tomb. I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? But there was a large group of people there who saw it, so much so that it says in the Gospel of John that all of those same people who were at that tomb, they were the same ones who were welcoming, walking with Jesus into Jerusalem. On that day, he rides on the, on the donkey. Why are they all there? Because they saw what this man could do, the power that he had. If you saw it, you would have been there too saying, ah, this has got to be the king we've been waiting for. John writes, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would have been written. This is just a taste of a few things, John says, that he did. People witnessed multiple acts of extraordinary power by this man. Extraordinary power. And if you saw that, what would you do? You'd do just what all of these people did. They, they began to, to muse, who is this guy? Uh, well, some of them you know, made a logical Connection. They said, oh, he must be a new prophet. You know, they, they believed God. They believed Moses. They believed that there was Isaiah and Jeremiah. And they, you know, had Elijah, Elisha. They, they had power. And so he must be just like them. That's logical, maybe. Other. 
others went like National Enquirer sensationalist tabloid direction, right? Some of the, oh, it's Elijah. Elijah's come back to life. Who's Elijah? 900 years ago, Elijah walked the earth. Yeah, the, Elijah must be here. I mean, that's front page National Enquirer. Or the, some of them went all gore. They, they went, you know, John the Baptist. John the Baptist just had his head cut off by a Herod. And they're like, ah, must have grabbed his head or put a different head on or something. I don't know. And it, there he is. It's John the Baptist. Why were they throwing around such wild conjectures about who this guy was? It's because they saw things they couldn't understand. I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't compare Jesus to UFOs. <laughs> but, look, the Congress of the United States right now are considering UFOs. It used to be the stuff of the National Enquirer. The, the, U, the U.S. Congress is saying, the U.S. Navy is saying there are things happening that we cannot explain what they are. If you look out at night and you see lights in the sky going in different directions that you know planes can't do, immediately you're trying to figure out what is that? How can that be? You try logical things, and then sometimes your mind goes to crazy things. That's what people do. Even the religious leaders did the same thing. Those who opposed Jesus, those who wanted to kill Jesus, you know why they wanted to kill him? Because they thought this power that he had was coming from the powers of darkness. They didn't deny he had this power. They saw it with their eyes. They just said, ah, that's from the pit of hell. We've got to get rid of this guy. And that's exactly what happened. All the speculation came to an end. Jesus was arrested. He was flogged. He was nailed and crucified to a cross. People watched him stop breathing on the cross. He hung there for hours for everyone to see. Four different accounts of his life tell us from various sources, from various angles, this man died. Luke says in his account of the crucifixion, when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away, but all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. They all saw it. And just to make sure he's dead, a sword is thrust in his side by a soldier, and liquid spills out a mixture of water and blood, bodily fluids. He's taken down from the cross. The two people who took him down, they're named Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Why do they name them? Because when this was written, they were still alive. You go talk to Joseph. You go talk to Nicodemus. And guess what? They're going to tell you that we ripped his hand off of that nail. We pulled his feet off the nail. People who are alive would make a sound. When you carry a dead man who is totally lifeless, you know the weight of it. Joseph and Nicodemus would have testified to that fact. They wrapped him in 30 pounds of cloth and gooey spices. Someone who is alive doesn't let that happen. And yet here we are, with the audacity to proclaim that Jesus Christ 
is alive. That he has been risen. 27 books declare, letters and books declare from that time period that this man was resurrected. And you think, how can that be? This can't happen. People who are dead do not come back to life. There must be some explanation. But, but do you know why? I, I, I'll just put out, why I, I think, why this is not crazy. First, because we've already spent six weeks exploring the character of Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself, on a number of occasions, told his disciples, I will be put to death, and then I will be resurrected to life. And a man of such exquisite character a man who was full of goodness and righteousness and humility. He's not going to lie. He told us the truth, and it happened. The second reason I would put forward that, yeah, this actually could have happened is because those who were present And the testimony that we read is that the man was full of power. He was full of life, giving power. He used that power to bring people to life, to give them life. And at least you need to be open that if he manifested power in that situation, he could have manifested this power in his own life. To be resurrected. But the third reason I, I would just put forward is just the, the witnesses themselves, the, the witnesses of the resurrection. They come across as reliable witnesses. They react just like you or I would react. They, they're not made out to be superheroes who just knew this was all going to happen. They reacted exactly like you or I in utter, total disbelief. John tells when Peter looks in the tomb, he has no idea what's going on. Mark ends this gospel talking about the women. They were left trembling and bewildered at first when they saw the open tomb, so much so that uh, some of the, they wouldn't even say anything. And, and by the way, If you're trying to write a story to convince others that somebody was resurrected in that time period, you would not make women the first choice of witnesses in a made-up story in that time period. They couldn't even test. Women could not testify in the court of law as to what is true and what was not. You would never make up a story where the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ were women. You just wouldn't do it. John tells us when Jesus appeared to the disciples, they were locked in a room, scared to death that they were next for the gallows. This is all reasonable. This is exactly, if you were in that situation, you would be thinking and doing the same things. And then we come to Thomas. Thomas reacted exactly like any of us would react. I will not believe that Jesus is alive unless I see his hands and his side and I see the the nail and the sword, the places where he was pierced. In other words, hey guys, you're nuts. He's not alive. I'm never going to see that. He's a realist. The man is dead. Then the resurrected Jesus, he confronts Thomas and says, hey, Thomas, stop doubting. Of course he doubts. He's he's reasonable. He's realistic. People don't rise from the dead. It, it, It is the way most of us 
would feel. People do not rise from the dead unless they do. Jesus extends his hand, touch my side. We're told further that 500 other people witnessed the resurrection of Christ. And and you know what else adds to the reasonableness, reasonableness of the claim of these first witnesses? That every single one of them went out and told people that this man was raised from the dead. They did so without fear or consequence. Uh, Most of the uh, disciples who walked with Jesus, uh, they scattered. And then they were put to death because they would not stop telling people that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's not how people live unless they really believe that it was the case. How to explain a resurrected Jesus, this man with extraordinary power? Was he a prophet? Elijah, John the Baptist, come back to life. In this moment of transformation in the heart of Thomas, from the moment of doubt to dis, from, from doubt to belief, Thomas had an explanation. Verse 27 says in our passage, Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. And what does Thomas say? Thomas says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. That's what John's conclusion was as well. Jesus' best friend, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, a man who walked with Jesus three years, he writes at the beginning of his Gospel account, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory. We saw his character. We saw his power. It was God. That's what Paul's conclusion was. Paul was once a Pharisaic persecutor of the church who then met the risen Christ. And he writes, the son is the image of the invisible God. God who was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Hebrews chapter 1 says the son is the radiance of God, of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Listen, sustaining all things by his powerful Word. That's what Thomas thought. That's what John thought. That's what the writer of Hebrews thought. That's what Paul thought. And doesn't it make sense? Doesn't that explain Jesus? Isn't that the best explanation of who Jesus was? Why he was so captivating? Why he was so attractive? Why he was so good? Why he was so pure and beautiful and powerful? It explains why when he's lifted up, men and women are drawn to him. It explains why his life is so central to to the history of humanity that even our calendars are based on on his birth. It's reasonable to believe that Jesus was God. It makes sense out of everything. And and here's what I don't get. I mean, I I get that Thomas was a doubter, that that he had doubts. It's all reasonable to, to, you know, it, it seemed crazy that this could actually happen, unless, of course, it did. But for for me, here's the thing that's difficult to understand is why why do people live in an irretractable skepticism that they would prefer not to investigate who this Jesus would just to, to dismiss him, that he wasn't resurrected, that he wasn't God. And here's why I don't understand that. We should all hope 
to God that Jesus was God. Because where else is your hope going to come from? Some of you are sitting here with a known diagnosis that is going to kill you. You are going to die. The rest of us are just waiting for it. Is that it? Is that life? Is that all there is? Here's the good news. The, that's what the gospel means. That's what good news, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, wrote accounts of the gospel. If Jesus was who he said he was, if he was raised from the dead, if Thomas was right, my Lord and my God, then all of the compassion that Jesus expressed to those in which he walked with in those days. All of that compassion is extended to you. He wants to extend that same compassion in your life. He wants to extend that goodness. He wants to bring his wisdom, his gentleness, his determination. The power that he had that healed and raised others to life. He wants to raise you to life. The same Jesus who healed and forgave and transformed the lives of those that we read in the, in the gospel accounts, he wants to do the same thing for us. Abundant life, joyful life, eternal life. If he's resurrected from the dead, if that account of his life multiple witnesses are true, then that resurrected life is extended to you if you would come unto him in relationship to him. His determination, which is crazy to think about. Why did he want to go to the cross and die so much? I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem. Why would he do that? Because he knows the weight of your sin and the guilt and the what it's done to you inside, outside, the relationship with God. And he wanted a way to take that sin and do away with it. And he knew he was the only one who could do that. If he's resurrected from the dead, you have a way to be free from the burden that you know you're carrying. I, I don't know why people would want to live in skepticism. I can understand being skeptical, but, but why not investigate and come to a determination in your own heart? D does this book make sense? Are these witnesses reliable? Stop doubting and believe, Jesus said. Blessed are those who weren't there, who didn't see it. But blessed are those who believe because of the witnesses that God used to convey what happened in this event. My Lord and my God. Why is it that a man who died 2,000 years ago on the cross just keeps drawing people to him. Why is it? Let me read to you to end what Paul writes to the Ephesians. Paul, who was once a Pharisaic persecutor of the church, who met the risen Christ. Here's what he writes to the church in Ephesians. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparable great power for those who believe, those who trust. 
That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power, dominion, and every other name that is invoked not only in the present age but also in the age to come. That's what Paul's prayer was for the Ephesians. That's, my, that's what my prayer is for you today. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would help us in our unbelief to believe. Lord, the, the same flutter of the heart that was felt by those who heard the spoken word of Jesus. We pray as we read the written word of God, the flutter would enter our hearts and transform our lives. We ask in his name. Amen.
You may have a seat. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we praise you and thank you and celebrate this Easter morning. God, we celebrate that you are risen. And God, even more than that, we celebrate that we were dead in sin, but because you rose to new life, Lord, so too do we have new life in you. That is the joy of Easter. The reason that we celebrate today, God, is that in you, you have raised us too. Lord, you have freed us from sin. You have enabled us to love one another, to do the good that on our own we could not do. God, you have reconciled us with one another. We get to call each other brother and sister where before there was enmity and strife between us. And God, we are reconciled with you. No longer are we running away from you, but because of Easter and the miracle of the resurrection, God, you tell us that you have adopted us as your children. You call us son and daughter, not because we deserved it or earned it or we've somehow made ourselves right before you, but because you loved us so much that you died on a cross and rose again so that we would be able to be one with you and with each other. God, that is what we celebrate today. God, that is your power that we've just talked about, your love in action, that you took our place and raised us to new life with you. So Lord, we just praise you and thank you again for all of that, for the miracle of Easter, that we get to be here as one body this morning and celebrate that together. God, we also remember that even as we are celebrating, Lord, so many of our friends and family and our brothers and sisters around the world, God, do not get to celebrate. We remember especially um, people in our congregation, God, who are not able to be here today because of illness, sickness, because they're in the hospital dealing with cancer, Lord, are taking care of other friends and family members. Lord, help us to remember them in our prayers. God, help make each of, each of us able to reach out and support them, to love them with our energy, with our time, and with our resources. God, we pray for our friends around the world, Lord, who are in the middle of war and strife right now. We especially remember our friends in Haiti, God, and just the rampant violence that's taken over that country. Lord, be with them. God, part of the miracle of Easter is that we also acknowledge that your kingdom is here, and yet it's still being manifest, God. God, your power is here, and yet we still need healing and forgiveness, and we need peace, Lord. And so we just ask for those that your power and your kingdom would be known today and made manifest in the ways that it currently can't, isn't seen, Lord. So God, we just ask for all of that today. And God, as we uh, have a time to take an offering, Lord, we pray that you would use our gifts for the good of your kingdom. God, that you would direct those resources to the people that need it most. Lord, we ask all of this today in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who we celebrate today, his resurrection. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to have a time to give our offerings um, before the Lord. Glory, we crown you with honor, Jesus, we crown. 
as the choir comes, we will sing Hallelujah Chorus. And we invite those of you who know it really well, just really well, to join us up here. <laughs> Otherwise, it is in your, in your hymnals, and you can sing along with us. It is now time for the Hallelujah Chorus.
We invite you to continue to uh, join us in fellowship. Uh, lots of wonderful morning treats across the way in our fellowship hall. Uh, what a wonderful time of worship this day as we have celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Go in his peace. Amen.